Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm going to read chapter 3 and 4 because I didn't do it yesterday. Um, but I have Twilight Hunger. Chapter 3. Maxine Stewart was watching JFK for about the 12th time on the little VCR slash TV combo in her bedroom. A copy of Catcher in the Rye on, in her lap a half-dead can of coke on the bedside stand. When she heard siren, when she heard the sirens, the sound stabbed her in the belly like an ice-cold blade and brought her slowly to her feet. Though she couldn't have said why, she went to the window, pushed the curtains aside. She could see the flashing lights of the emergency vehicles passing on the highway in the distance. Heading south, her gaze turned in that direction, and she narrowed her eyes on the faint red glow in the distance, distant night sky. A familiar jeep bounded into her driveway, and at about a second later, she heard the front door of the small house open, heard her mother speaking to Max's friends as she let them in. Maxine shut the TV off turned open oh, it turned and opened her bedroom door as they came hurrying through the house her two best friends came around the corner into the hall and stopped when they saw her standing there something was up Jason didn't shake easily and he looked shaken storm her real name was Tempest but she hated it was downright pale. Maxine's mom was right on their heels. So what is it? What's burning? Max asked. It's spook central, Jason said without even missing a beat. It's bad. It's awful, Storm added, and her round jewel blue eyes were damp. I don't think anyone got out alive. Spook central was Maxine's pet name for the large nameless government compound just outside town. The main building was huge and set well back from the road behind a large electrified fence surrounded by surveillance cameras and shrouded in secrecy. A research lab that was the party line anyway, and so the gullible locals believed. Medical research was done there. They were working on finding cures for cancer and AIDS, stuff like that. Good work. Almost holy, too sacred to mess with or poke around in. Who would question such a saintly mission? Maxine and her own Maxine had her own theories, as she did about most things. And right now, she hoped to God that one she had always concerned considered the most likely that the place was a military lab working on germ warfare and chemical weapons was dead wrong. Nightmare images from Stephen King's The Stand coiled and uncoiled in her mind until she shook them away and stepped into action. She, she turned, reaching back into her room to snatch a jacket from the back of a chair. Then she was striding down the hall. Let's go. Go. Go where? Her mother asked, fa falling into step behind the three of them. As they headed for the front door, when no one replied, Ellen got around them, stepping right into their path. Max, don't go over there. You'll just get in the way and maybe get hurt. Come on, Mom. I'm 20 years old. I'm not going to bother the firefighters. I just want to know what's going on. Then read about it in the morning paper, like everyone else. God, how can you be so innocent? Ellen Stewart sighed, looked worried, but also resigned. No one had ever really been able to change Maxine's mind once it was made up about something, and her mother ought to be getting used to that by now, having experienced it firsthand from the day she brought the three-month-old orphan home for the first time. Be careful. Always. Maxine yanked a mini backpack off the hook by the door. An iron-on patch with the words, Trust No One, and the X-Files logo decorated its front. She slung it over her shoulder, and the three friends tro trooped out of the house. They all piled into Jason's cream-colored
coffeed color Jeep Cherokee. He liked to joke that he had picked the color to match his skin, and it did, pretty closely. Maxine took the back seat, Stormy, a pixie-sized psych major, with short, short, spiky, bleached hair, got into the front with Jason, closing her door just as he backed out of the street and headed out of town. Maxine sat on the edge of her seat, her head beneath the two in the front. You can see the fire from here. Look at that. They did. Stormy shivered, lowered her, eye, lowered her eyes. Jason stared as if mesmerized for a moment, then snapped it out of it, flicking on the radio, turning the dial. I knew you'd want to go, he said. It came over my brother's scanner. If he wasn't a volunteer firefighter, I probably still wouldn't know. Still, nothing about it on the radio, Jay, Stormy asked. She was nervous. Playing with her eyebrow, eyebrow ring was always a sign of that. He kept flick, flicking the dial, then gave up, shaking his head slowly. I expected special reports, crap like that, but... There hasn't been a word. Uh, they, re they, they report what they're told to report, Maxine said. Despite my mother's gullibility, gullible belief in the system, the phrase free press is an oxymoron in this country. I like your mom, Jason put in. Max blinked at him as if he were speaking another language. I like her too. What the hell does that have to do with anything? I just don't think you ought to be calling her gullible. gullible. She wouldn't like it. Maxine closed her eyes, shook her head, then glanced at Stormy for backup. He's right, Stormy said. Your mom is cool. You're so lucky. Of course she's cool. Hell, I would have gotten a dorm room or an apartment or gone to college out of town if she wasn't cool. Instead of staying home and going to a local school, but this has nothing to do with my mother or how cool she may or may not be. I'm talking about the government here. Cover-ups. Covert operations. Stormy shrugged, averting her eyes. Topics like this always made her uncomfortable, but Maxine wasn't uncomfortable discussing it. She was more uncomfortable having lived practically in the shadow of that huge fenced and well-guarded compound all her life and never and never once knowing what went on inside. She knew only one thing for sure. It wasn't cancer research. She would have given her eye teeth for a look beyond the tall, electrified fence of that place. Just one look. Now maybe no one would ever know the truth. Jason drove on, pulling the jeep over onto the right-hand shoulder before they got to the point where emergency vehicles lined both sides of the road. Highway flares lay across the pavement. Orange and white striped sawhorses with red reflectors were lined up behind them, forming a boundary that was supposed to tell them to keep out. They got out of the jeep. Flames in the distance licked at the night sky, and Max could hardly, t could already taste the smoke in her mouth with every breath. This way, Maxine walked along the road's right shoulder. Beyond the parked vehicles and her friends followed. The burning compound was on the left at the end of a long curving drive. She led the others forward until they were directly across the street from the entrance to the compound. Firefighters were across the street partway along the drive, drive facing away from them. They were completely focused on their work anyway. Maxine crouched near an ambulance, tugging the others down with her. The fire trucks had apparently driven straight through the gate at the head of the drive. The guardhouse nearby was empty, the gate itself lying flat, the fence to the left and right of it was buckled and broken. The first surveillance cameras that had been mounted to pose lay smashed to bits. Volunteer firefighters in yellow jackets marked with glowing silver reflecting, reflective tape, manned huge hoses attached to tanker trucks in the carving path, paved drive. Every time they beat the flames down a little, the trucks would roll closer, the man pushing further into the fury. 
I don't know how they can stand it. God, I can feel the heat from here, Stormy said, pressing a palm to her face. I'm surprised their hoses aren't melting, Jason whispered. If they move any closer, if they move any closer, we'll be able to get in. The other two looked at Maxine as if she had sprouted horns. What? She asked. You've got to be out of your freaking mind, Max, Jason told her, while Storm just shook her head. We can't go in there. No one's watching the entrance. They're all distracted, fighting the fire. We can't get in without even trying. Okay, I'll rephrase that. We can go in there, but we shouldn't. Now it was Maxine's turn to gape. What are you, crazy? I've been dying to get behind those gates since I was old enough to see through the lame, that lame cancer research cover story they've been using. Which was when she was about six, Stormy muttered. Max sh shot her a look, but hurried on. Don't you guys get it? This is our chance. No guards, nothing. We can finally see something behind the lies. Besides the lies. And just what do you think there's going to be left to see, Max? Jason pointed at the place. It's completely engulfed in flames. I won't know until I try. He sighed, lowering his shaved head and running a hand over it. No one spoke again for a long time as they crouched and waited and watched. Twenty minutes went by before the firefighters pushed a few yards closer. Max shot to her feet, glanced both ways, and ran across the street. The two, her two friends hesitated and followed. They crossed the pavement and jogged through the opening right over the mesh of the top toppled gate, past the abandoned guardhouse and into the trees that lined the driveway. There was a lot of them, the better to block the place from the view of casual passerby. Max thought pines. Of course they were pines. Year-round camouflage for whatever went on inside. They ducked behind, beneath one of the trees, and Max stared ahead. The fire was being steadily beaten at, down. Those firefighters were something else, she thought, wondering if Jay's older brother Mike was among them. They never gave up, even though they had re had to realize by now that it was a lost cause. More sirens came, and Max looked back toward the road to see police cars, cops getting out, dispersing some of the curious onlookers who had now begun to gather on the road out front. We just made it in time, she whispered. If they catch us in here, our asses will be toast, Jason said. If we get any closer to that inferno, there might might be toast anyway. They might be toast anyway, Stormy added. The fireman ha head fought on, soaking the place down, beating back the flames and pressing ever closer. The trucks ro rolled forward a little more, and Max urged her unwilling comrades to do the same. See the flagpole. Wait, I need no one to stop. See the flagpole over there, she asked, pointing. Jason and Storm looked at it, then at her. Once they get up that far, we can cut around the side of the building and make our way out, wait, make our way to the back. And then a flaming wall can come down on us, crushing us and roasting us at the same time, Storm said. Her gaze was fixed on the burning building, and the flames' reflections danced in her eyes. Max swallowed any second thoughts. She had about dragging her two best friends into this. Beat them down the way the firefighters beat down the flames. It was for the greater good, she told herself. And besides, they wouldn't get hurt. She wouldn't let them get hurt. Maxine Stewart took care of her friends. Moments, mo mo sorry, movement drew her attention. There they go. As the fire trucks rolled ahead, Max ran forward, cutting off to the left and moving rapidly away from the pool of firefighter of firelight that spread like an aura from ground zero. The trees ended there and she paused at the very last one. She tried not to feel a huge sense of relief when she realized Jason and Storm were still at her side. But she felt it anyway. God they were they were loyal. The distance from the front to the back of the rubble that had once been the main building was at least half a football field without so much as a shrub for cover. 
but it was dark, getting darker with every cloud of thick smoke that wafted from the fire. We can make it, Max said. They're going to haul our asses to jail for this, Max. Jason said, ready? Neither of them answered her. Max licked her lips and trusted them. Go, and she ran. She was never certain they were following until she stopped when she reached what had been the far end of the building and they bumped into her in the darkness, hands gripped shoulders as they steadied each other. Then they stood for a mo move moment, catching their breaths, squinting into the darkness. Where there were fifty feet between where they stood and the smoldering remains at the rear of the building. It no longer much resembled a, a building at all. It wasn't tall or square. It was a heap. Flames leaped here and there, al although most of the real fire had moved hungrily toward the front, having had its fill here, it seemed. There were glowing red shapes forming mounds underneath the charred forms of the skeletal underpinning. Painting. There were ashes, smoke. Were there people in there? She wondered. Bodies? This is close enough, Stormy whispered. Max looked around. You see that shrub over there? It's out of the smoke, she pointed. You two wait for me there. I promise I won't be long. Don't, Max, Jason warned. He sounded pissed off. Just don't. Five minutes, she said. Just five freaking minutes. This is a once in a lifetime, Jay. She didn't wait for him to argue. She ran instead. They didn't follow this time. It was hot, darn, damned hot, and the smoke was burning her eyes and her nose, and she kept trying not to cough too loudly and give herself away. She ran until she reached the rear of the building, and then she moved closer and closer to it, as close as she could stand to get. She figured her hair was probably getting a little singed, and she had to watch where she put her feet to keep from stepping on smoldering embers that would have melted right through the sole of her shoes. She looked around, squinting through the veil of smoke in these shimmer, shimmering heat waves. There were several things on the ground in one area. Large broken boxes, computers smashed to bits. Some burned and charred, others just smashed. Had someone thrown them out of the window in an effort to save them, or maybe to destroy them? She kicked at one what she wouldn't have given for a hard drive from one of those machines. God only knew what she might find. Bending down, she reached out to pick through the pile of rubble, but the pieces were so hot they seared her fingers, and she jerked her hand away, sucking air through her teeth. Crap. She put her burned fingers to her lips, blew on them drew them away and shook them in the air she kept walking. Her foot kicked something that rolled and she realized and she looked down, frowning. Looking closer when, when she realized she was bending over a charred forearm and hand. She pulled back so suddenly and she almost fell over. Jesus. Her, bre her breathing quickened now, her lungs sucking in more smoke with every breath, but she couldn't be helped. She continued her search, spotting other evidence of human remains in the wreckage. More and more of it, bodies, parts of bodies. It was as if she had stepped into hell's dumping ground. Jesus, why hadn't anyone been able to get out alive? What what the hell happened here? This was stupid. She had been a fool to come here. She started to turn to go back when movement caught her eye. Movement in the smoky distance. She went still, squinting, staring. Gradually, the movement took shape. A man, his clothes burned. His skin so sooty, she couldn't tell if he was black or white. He was hunched over, walking unevenly, bending and straightening over and over again. It looked as if he was picking things up, dragging himself away from the wreckage, and picking things up as he went. She was about to offer help, to help him when she heard her name shouted from a distance. The man heard Stormy's call, too, and he went, went stiff, jerking his head toward the voice. A tongue of flame leapt to life somewhere near him and illuminated his face for just a, an instant. His hair had been burned completely away from one side of his head, and the scalp and one side of his face was charred, black, with pink showing through here and there. She tried to memorize his features, the rounded face, the shape of his chin, he 
tucked whatever he had been holding into his pocket and ran into a lumbering, uneven gate away from the voice and straight and right towards Maxine. She ducked down, held her breath, willed herself not to move. She didn't know for sure if the man was dangerous, but if he were up to anything good, he wouldn't have been running away. Maybe he was just a snoop like she was, but probably not. He had been inside the bur that burning building. That much was obvious. He, he limped past her, never even looking down at her as she sat there, fighting not to shiver in fear. He moved cl cl so close she could smell his charred flesh, and it made her stomach clench reflectively. Something fell from his jacket. Something. No, two something. Somethings. Dropped to the hot, rubble-strewn ground right at her feet. He never noticed. Just kept going, dragging one leg, glump, lung, lunging with the other until he vanished in the smoke. Swallowing hard, Maxine reached for the items. One was a CD-ROM the other some kind of ID badge. She swore every nerve ending in her body tingled with electricity as she tucked the two still warm items carefully into her pocket and turned away turn turning ran back the way she had come. She refused to look again at the carnage, refused to look behind her even when she swore she felt the disfigured man's gazing gaze burning into her back. She just hurried as fast as she could Back to where she left her friend and fell to her knees near the shrub where they waited. God, thank God you're back, Storm said. She bent over, Max stroking her back. Are you all right? What happened back, back there? Did you find anything? What did you see? Jason asked. Maxine lifted her head, looked at him. It's there. It's there were bodies. Oh God, Storm said, closing her eyes. Max gripped Jason's forearm, and he helped her to her feet. Let's get the hell out of here, okay? He suggested she nodded. They fell into step together with Max in the center, her two friends flanking her almost protectively. They had made it almost all the way to the front gate when the sounds of rumbling motors flooded the night and vehicles came roaring across the street into the drive. They ducked to the nearby pines, watching a cameo painted trucks and jeeps. The spotlights mounted on them, pounded past at least one vehicle, vehicle and a machine gun mounted on a tripod in the back. Soldiers armed with weapons came spilling out of the trucks and fanned out into the grounds. Ten feet ahead of Max, a cop stood with his back to them, looking at the commotion with his head tilted to one side, her cop, Maxine realized with a rush of relief. Jason saw him at the same time, squeezed Max's arm, whispered, Cop, it's okay, it's Lou Malone. Jason sent her a frown. He teaches that woman's self-defense course I take. You remember him, Jay? Storm put in. He used to work our high school dances. He's the one Maxie always had a crush on. Oh yeah, that one. He sent Max a look that... Asked if she still did, but she just rolled her eyes and looked away. Someone spoke into a bullhorn, startling her so much that she jerked her gaze away from the back of Lou's head. This is a gover this is a government facility and therefore a military operation. Local firefighters are to seize all activity at once. No one is to leave the site without clearance. Line up in an orderly fashion near the front gate, and you'll be escorted off the premises that is all what the hell is going on max storm whispered clutching at max's arm they've got guns they're not going to use them jason tried to sound confident and sure of himself but missed that goal by about a mile i mean they're soldiers they have to carry guns right they watched from their pine scented blind as the soldier tugged firearm tugged firearm away from their hoses Oh, fireman. I said fire hose. I'm sorry. Fireman away from the hoses, yeah. Some of the firefighters obeyed, moving to form a straggling line by the gate. Those who didn't move fast enough were searched where they were. 
then escorted to the front gate and through it. Mo more soldiers searched the fire trucks and the vehicles into the streets as well. Well, I'll be dipped, Officer Malone said to himself. What the hell is this all about? Licking her laps, Maxine stepped out of her cover, walked up to Lou and cleared her throat. He turned fast and gaped at her in surprise. He, she loved him, had since 10th grade, and it didn't matter that his face was hard and lined or that he was 18 years older. He's 38. Uh, 18 years older than she was or that he was, he saw her as a little more than a pain in the ass kid with a big imagination. Well, if it isn't Mad Maxie Stewart, my favorite redhead, he said, shaking his head slowly. Why the hell am I not surprised to see you here? Hey, Lou, I just wanted to see the fire. Uh-huh, he glanced at her, at her friends. Don't you two know you better, don't you two know better than to let her drag you into her schemes? They shrugged and said nothing. Lou, I don't like this, Max said. The whole soldier bit. They're searching everyone. Yeah, I see that. Just an excuse to grope the female, Stormy said. If they think they're going to run their hands all over my body, they'd better think again. Maxine watched Lou's eyes slide to hers as Stormy spoke and knew her friend had fallen on the right tactic. I don't relish the idea of them copying a fill of my ass either, Storm. Even as she said it, a soldier slammed a firefighter who resisted him up against the guardhouse. Lou saw it and winced. I'm scared, Lou. I just want to get out of here, Max said. Lou Malone pursed his lips and thought. Then finally he nodded. It's not like you kids are any threat to national security. These guys are a little overzealous, I think. Look, there's a break in the fence just past those pines. See that tallest one? It's near, though. Go on. Get out of here. I never saw you. Thanks, Lou. He gave Max, Maxine a worried look, not, worried nod, and impulsively she leaned up and planted a kiss on his cheek. Get your ass straight home, Mad Max. No more screwing around with grown-up stuff, okay? I promise, he, she said. Then she ran off in the direction he had shown her. I hope I have enough time to read this. Max waited until Jason and Storm had gone home. She told them nothing about the man she had seen gathering evidence from the rubble. Nothing about the trophy she had covered. She didn't want to tell them anything that could put them in danger or make them accessories. If what she had done turned out to be a crime. Late that night, very late, she gently wiped the soot off from the partially melted plastic of the name badge. There was a photograph of a man and the word Frank W. Stiles. Security level Alpha DPI. She knew what security level Alpha meant. She had learned that the first time she tried to uncover the truth about UFOs and government cover ups. Alpha was a word used to indicate the top level security clearances in certain agencies under the auspicious of the CIA. But in all of her years of research, she had never once come across any re reference to any agency or operation called DPI. Jesus, what the hell had she stumbled upon? She was nearly shaking when she washed the soot from the CD-ROM and slid it into her computer, praying the heat hadn't ruined it. It hadn't. When she clicked run, the driver whirred and the, and the screen went black. Red letters lit up the screen. Top, top Secret Documents of the Division of Paranormal Investigations Case Files D145.9 slash H376.51 Continue The final word blinked its question at her, almost daring her to take it up on the challenge. Stiffening her spine, she clicked the, on the word and brought up a table of contents. Names. They were simply names. Damien, a.k.a. Named her. Damien, a.k.a. Gilgamesh. Daniels Matthew. Daniela. Dante. Devon Josefina. Obviously alphabetical. The list began in the D's and ended with in the H's. Some of the first 
some were first and last names, some were only one name. They were maybe a hundred entries as she could tell without counting. Clicking back to the top of the list, she began scrolling down. Then she came to one that made her stop in her tracks. Dracula Vlad. See full bio for alias list. What the hell? Curious, she clicked on the name and a graphic popped up. A drawing, not of a not a photo of a thoroughly modern looking man with long black hair and unusually full lips. The most well known of the species, he was born in Carpathia and transformed as nearly as we can tell in his early twenties. Sired by an unknown enemy soldier, probably a Turk, most recent sighting May nineteen ninety two, Paris. Most recent sighting, she blinked at the screen, her mind not quite digesting what she had seen, ninety two. Below the graphic, with its piercing eyes and pale skin, were more choices. Known kills, known associates, known, ha known havens, full bio. Give me one minute. What in the, <clears throat> what in the name of God is this crap? She hit the back button, clicked on another name in the list, and again was brought to a screen with an image of a person. This one an actual photograph labeled Taken Before Transformation and a brief bio. Josephina Devon, born in Brooklyn, New York in 1962, transformed in the summer of her 30th year, June 1992. Sire R slash 532 aka Rihanna. R Rihanna. I'm just going to say Rihanna. The Vampire. Vampire was captured by DPI researchers in December of the same year. Held at DPI headquarters in White Plains, New York, USA. Expired in captivity in 1995. Again, the same choices were offered for further information. This time with one notable addition. Test performed on the subject and results of same. This was not real. This could not be real. When she clicked on full bio, she found a document more than a hundred pages long, with details that made her mind spin with the impossibility of it all. When she opened the file that referred to test performed, she thought she was going to be ill. This person, this woman, had been a lab rat, held and experimented upon in that very building in her own town, but no, it it hadn't happened because it wasn't real. There was no such thing as vampires, much less a covert government agency devoted to researching them. And yet, here was the proof that there were. There were. What the hell was she supposed to do now? The next day, she still hadn't decided when the doorbell rang and she answered it to find no one there. Just an unmarked manila envelope on the doorstep. Her mother was already at work most days. She left before Max was even out of the bed. The odd delivery made Max incurious, particularly after last night. She looked down and looked up and down the street. No strangers lurking, lurked anywhere. No suspicious vehicles with tinted windows slid past. The neighborhood was stirring to stirring to life. People opening their doors, picking up their morning papers. Maxine picked up the envelope, looked at it, turned it over, nothing. Not one word. Not a label, not a stamp. Frowning, she bent, went back inside, closing and locking the door behind her. She took the envelope to the kitchen table, opening it as she walked, and she tipped it, dumping the contents out beside her bowl of cornflakes. Photos, what the hell, she found. Polaroids, three of them. Then she blinked and snatched them up. That was Jason, sound asleep in his bed. She moved it to the back of the pile. The next shot was of Stormy from the neck up in her shower, in her own shower. Maxine swore and took and looked at the third one. It was a shot of her mother getting out of her car in the parking garage of the hospital where she worked as an RN. The telephone rang and she damn near jumped out of her skin. Maxine clenched her teeth, dropped the photos on the table, and went to pick up the phone. Do you like the photos, Maxine? The voice was a whisper, so cold it sent a chill down her back spine. Who the hell is this? Maxine reached 
toward the answering machine on the table, jabbed the record button with her forefinger. Those shots were all taken in the past 12 hours, you know. Why? Her hand was clenched, clenching the telephone so hard her knuckles were white. She wished it was this son of a... S.O.B. <laughs> I'll just say that. S.O.B.'s neck. How dare he? God, he'd been in Jason's bedroom, in Stormy's bathroom, and in the dark parking garage alone with her mother. To show you how easy it is for me to learn everything about you and how quickly and effortlessly I can get to the people you love, to shoot them with a camera this time, but you fuck with my family or my friends and you die. You understand me? That's quite the threat, coming from a girl barely out of high school. He laughed, a deep, low sound that changed into a racking cough. Max held the phone away from her her ear, looking at, is it, as, at it as a realization dawned. It was him, the burned guy she had, she'd seen at the fire. He must have seen her after all. She stopped. He stopped coughing. And she put the phone back to her ear. Why are you calling me? What do you want from me anyway? I want you to forget everything you saw last night. Pretend you were never there. Tell no one. Fine, I'll be glad to if you tell me what happened there last night. I'm not making a bargain with you, Maxine. You'll do as I say. Forget you ever saw me. But listen to me, you little nosy little bitch. She jerked in reaction to the anger in his voice. If you so much as mention anything about seeing me at that fire to anyone, the next thing you'll find on your doorstep will be a body or a part of one. I'll just shuffle those photos and pick one at random. Are you following me now? Yes, she paused, took a breath. Her outrage completely smoldered by fear. He would hurt her mother, her friends. Yes, I look. I don't know anything. I'm not no threat to you. And I'm the only person that saw you. I didn't tell them. I didn't tell anyone. They don't know anything. She was shaking. She pressed a hand to the wall because her legs felt so unsteady. That's good. See that it stays that way. I'll be watching you, Maxine. And rest assured, I know. I know how. I'm going to hear everything you say and see everything you do. Don't test me. I won't. He hung up the phone. Maxine wanted to sink to the floor. She looked around. Her feeling exposed, vulnerable. She expressed the cut off, then lifted it again. With a trembling forefinger, she punched the star key, then the six and nine. Maybe she shouldn't. Maybe he was kidding and would know she had tried. The last number that called this line was the computer-generated voice and said, it, then it paused at its components, working. We're sorry, that number is not available. It clicked off. Swallowing hard, Maxine... Hung up the phone. What the hell is she supposed to do now? Was he watching her? Could he yet see? Could he even? Could he see her even now? Where there are bugs or hidden cameras in her house? She searched, searched her mind and mentally wondered what Oliver Stone would do. She told herself to use her hand to think. Okay, the guy had being in the fire last night, wounded, burned, suffering from smoke insulation too by the sounds of that, his cough. He must have spotted her leaving, maybe even followed her home, and then followed Jason and Storm. He learned where they lived, went and got a camera, sneaked back, and took the shots. Then he returned to Max's home and watched the place. He followed her mom to work in the wee hours of this morning and taken that shot of her. Then he'd come back here and dropped off the envelope and made the phone call, not from the very... Not from the payphone, because that would have been traceable. His cell phone, maybe. She leaned over the answering machine, but hit rewind and then play. And the tape played black. She heard traffic sounds in the background, some telltale static. She stopped the machine, popped the micro cassette out, micro cassette out, and he was on the road, on the move. He would have been. He would have been watching her, yes, if he were CIA. He would have known how to plant bugs and cameras, but she didn't think he had caught. He had the time to do those things yet. He probably figured he could scare her enough to keep her on the straight and narrow until he had all his ducks in a row. Okay, I'm going to have to finish this chapter in the next video, so just keep an eye out for it. Bye.